Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this video where we're talking about lab assignment 04 for Kinesi 6770, Instrumentation and Measurement and Movement Science. So I'm recording this video in order to walk you through the applied example that we have in this lab assignment because I will be out of town uh, during the actual class. And I wanted to talk you through each of the different steps um, so that you can see a worked example and make sure that you arrive at the, the correct answer. Um, now, obviously, I'd like you to try this first on your own and work in small groups to determine, you know, the solutions to each of these individual questions. Um, but after you've, you know, you've tried it for a while or if you get stuck on a particular point, go ahead, watch this video. Um, you can see my code, which I will also share on the class webpage, um, and then you can work your way through each of the different problems. Now, I will suggest some ideas about how you might want to solve these problems, but there are going to be multiple correct answers. So obviously, feel free to take my code and, and tweak it in a way you see fit, either in terms of the aesthetics um, or, or really substantially adjust it um, if there are other sorts of data visualizations that you actually want to use um, that you think better represent the data um, uh, that, that maybe I hadn't thought of or that you just happen to like better. Um, but the goal here is to create quality data visualizations that are going to answer each of the questions that we have down below. And these questions are the sorts of things you might want to encounter in data analysis, right? That is, prior to actually doing your statistical analysis and you're doing sort of quality assurance checks on your data, Data. Can you make sure you know, that you understand the shape of your data, certain relationships, the amount of missing data, all those kinds of things that we want to do to make sure that we have good, high-quality data before we format it into the way that we need in order to con uh, conduct our statistical analysis. So in the lab assignment, right, we have this applied example at the end. Um, where we're going to be working off of this data underscore cat underscore learn underscore master data file. And in class, we talked about the structure of this data set a little bit, but um, briefly speaking, this is coming from a learning study in psychology uh, in which participants were asked to uh, correctly categorize stimuli based on trial and error learning. So in the data file, there are some key variables uh, that we're going to work with. The first is the subject number called sub ID. The second is a trial number called trial. And the, th the third is a stimulus category called stim cat. So these are sort of structural variables about the experiment. They tell us which trial the subject was on and which stimulus category they are currently seeing on that trial. We're also going to get some variables related to the participant's behavior, right? So we're going to see whether or not the current response was correct, which is a variable called correct, and the response time on the current trial, which is called resp underscore time, uh, which is a, a measure of response time in milliseconds, right? So the time from when the stimulus came on the screen to when they pressed a button indicating their answer. So between these two variables, we have a sense of their accuracy, right, whether or not the trial was correct, and then also their speed. How long did it take them to generate those answers? So now I'm going to walk through each of these questions in the code, right, uh, and, and I'm going to toggle over to R so that you can follow along. I also will have posted a copy of my R script um, on the web page so that you can see the answers to each of these questions. So in the first question, we want to create a plot showing the univariate distribution of response time, and we want to insert that plot below to determine if this distribution is positively or negatively skewed. So I'm going to switch over um, to R. First thing that I'm going to do is add the tidyverse uh, functions to my library. Then you, we can check on the, the working directory. Right? Because this was created in our R project file, um, the current working directory should be set to that learning study folder, right? Because that's one of the nice things about creating an R project. It associates everything with the working directory that R project is saved in. And indeed, if I list the files, you can see that I have three different files in there. One of them is our data file, one of them is the current script file, and then one of them is the R project file. So if I want to import that data, my working directory is currently set to the right place. So I just need to read in that CSV and save it as an object called, in this case, dat one. Now, in our first question, where we want to look at a univariate distribution of response times, uh, the first thing that I'm going to do is run call names in order to get a list of the actual column names in this data file. Um, and you can see, just as a reminder, here are the different column names that we have to work with. And we are mostly interested in this response time variable. And we want to see a univariate distribution of response time, which is to say we want to see response time uh, on its own, not conditioned on other factors, right? So we don't want to look at response time as a function of person or stimulus category or correct or incorrect responses. We just want to see response time. So there's different ways that we could do this. Right, the first is that we could actually create a histogram. So we'll use ggplot plus geom histogram. Uh, and that takes a little while to run because if we're doing these bin widths with this response time data, 
Every participant has a unique response time, uh, so that makes it hard to actually bin these categories, which means our geome histogram function has to draw a lot of different lines uh, in order to fill out this histogram. But if you give it enough time to run, you get a plot that looks something like this. So we have the number of observations that fall into each of those bins, and then our response time in milliseconds along the x-axis. And you can see that some of these participants took a very long time prior to responding as they were thinking about the different categories to which these stimuli might belong. A different way to do this that might be a little bit better is actually to use the geome density function. So rather than the histogram, I can use the density function to plot an approximation of the density uh, for this distribution. Now, I do lose some information here, potentially, because it's a little harder to see exactly where some of these bumps are. And now on the y-axis, instead of uh, the actual count, I have the density of observations. But this density function is really good for giving me the impression of my data. So if I want something that compiles a little bit faster, and if sort of the qualitative impression is more important than the absolute quantity of observations, this density plot might be a very good way to convey the information that we're looking for. In either case, though, both of these plots are going to tell us that the distribution of response time is pretty heavily right skewed, with most of our data falling below 50,000 milliseconds, right? Um, but a substantial chunk of the data tailing off here into the upper end of the distribution. So this positive skew, or the, this right skew that we're observing here, is something common in response time data, because obviously response time can never go below zero, but it's often going to be pretty long uh, and pretty positive. So let me actually toggle back to my previous plot. I'm going to export this. Uh, for now, I'll just copy it to the clipboard, um, although I could certainly save it as a separate file. But I'll copy that plot, come back over into Word, right, and paste it in uh, in order to answer that, that question. Next, we want to create a plot to show the distribution of response times as a function of stimulus category. Do participants seem to be having a harder time with one category than the others? If we go back to R, right, we can see on question two, uh, the first thing that I'm doing is I'm renaming stimulus category, or sorry, I'm overwriting stimulus category to be a factor version of the original stimulus category, because this variable was just the numbers one to five, but rather than being numeric, I want it to be treated as a factor, so I'm going to run the code here uh, on line 15. From there, again, I have a few different options for how I might want to visualize this. The first one, I'm going to show the distribution of response times as a function of stimulus category overlaid on top of each other. So here you can see I have five different density plots um, with each stimulus category a different color. And I've set a transparency by changing alpha to 0 0.4. Um, so those semi-transparent plots overlay on top of each other. And you can see that the distributions all seem relatively similar. Certainly it seems like the peak for category five is a bit lower and it might extend a little farther out into the tails, right? But otherwise, these don't look too different uh, in this plot that I have here. One thing with this plot, though, uh, is that these overlapping distributions start to get a little bit busy. Uh, and even though we have that transparency enabled, it can be slightly hard to tell exactly you know, how these different distributions are shaped. So what I might do instead is actually create a different plot based on the same underlying geomes, but I'm going to facet wrap it based on stimulus category. And I'm going to set the number of rows to five so that I get each density plot overlapped on top of each other. Um, and then you can see here are the densities for each of those different stimulus categories unpacked and layered. Um, and, and rather than being layered on top of each other, I get a series of stacked plots. So I like this response time plot a little bit better in this situation. But again, there are certainly other ways you could generate this plot. I'm going to go ahead and copy it to the clipboard. I'm going to go into Word. Right, and insert that plot in order to answer this question. And then we need to say, do participants seem to be having a harder time with one category than the others? Um, and the distributions here actually look relatively similar. If we did a more detailed investigation, right, we might find that they're actually, yes, they are, are having a harder time with one of the categories than the others. But based on this relatively sort of rough approximation of the distribution of response times, um, people send, seem to be spending similar amounts of time on each of our different stimulus categories. So I would probably say no here, right? Again, if you did a more detailed investigation of response time, though, you might come to a slightly different answer. But based on this, we would say, no, nah, these distributions look pretty similar.
All right, so then for question number three, um, we want to look at the total number of correct responses per stimulus category per person, and then generate a plot to show these accuracy data. Now, then we can also answer this question, does it seem like some of the stimulus categories were easier to learn than others? So in order to do that, right, we're going to start on line 26 here in the code. I'm going to run column names again to look at the different types of uh, data that we have. And we have two variables that correspond to accuracy information. The first one is called hit, and it is a numerically coded variable where a correct response is coded as a positive one and an incorrect response was coded as negative one. So this is a numeric representation of accuracy. The other one is called correct. Uh, and it is a categorical representation. So uh, responses are either listed as correct or incorrect. And you can see that we have 1,899 correct responses, 2,900 incorrect responses, and then one that probably due to a data collection error, we did not get a response for uh, from the participant on one trial. So the issue with this is that this data are not in the format that we actually want because what we want to know is the total number of correct responses per person per stimulus category. So in order to do that, we would first need to group our data set by stimulus category and participant, and then total up the number of correct responses in each of those categories. So that's what I have here on line 30. We can push that uh, uh, dat1, right, our original data frame, through a series of pipes in which we select the number of variables that we want, then that gets pushed through a pipe into our group by function, and then that gets pushed through a pipe into our summarize function, in which ultimately what we are looking for is a new variable called total correct, which is equal to the sum of the correct, uh, or sorry, it's equal to the sum of the logical statement, the variable correct, the value is correct. So anytime for the variable correct, the value is correct, this would return true, and the sum is gonna count that as a one. Anytime the variable correct does not equal the value correct, it would return false, and the sum is going to treat that as a zero. So then what we should end up with right, is a new data frame in which we have um, the number correct per stimulus category uh, per person. So I can look at this now. I'm going to first recreate stimcat as a factor of the numeric version of stimulus category. Then I can look at the head of this data frame. And you can see, okay, I've got subject one for categories one through five. Here is the total number of correct responses they had in each of those categories. And then subject number two, right, it starts with stimulus category one, but it would continue down here for numbers one through five. And I have the total number of correct responses in each of those categories. Once I have this restructured data frame where I've aggregated over individual trials to get the total number correct for each person in each stimulus category, I can then run different ggplot commands in order to visualize these data and see now I have one data point per person per category, and I can look at the distribution of correct responses in each category. Right? So it looks like in general, um, people had you know, less than 10 certainly correct responses in each category, although some people clearly learned the task better than others and tended to have a fairly high rate of responding. Um, but uh, we can also look at the, these distributions to say, are any of these categories slightly different? And indeed, it looks like, again, this isn't a statistical assessment, right? But this is a qualitative assessment based on our visual inspection of the data. It looks like category five was maybe a little bit tougher for our participants. You can see that we don't have anybody maxing out accuracy up here at the upper end. And indeed, we have a number of people on the floor. Um, so these data points are jittered, so they don't all line up exactly on zero. Um, but all these, these people, none of them got any of category five correct. Right? Whereas that's not really true for our other stimulus categories. We maybe had one person who never got category two and one person who never got category one, but we don't actually, we, we see a substantial number of people who never got anything correct in category five. So category five was maybe harder to learn, right? And if this pattern was drastically different, um, that might be, suggest something to me problematic in, uh, in category five and how do I want to treat it in, in my data analysis? Do I need to uh, control for that in some way? The other way we could look at that is rather than using box plots, we could use violin plots. 
So violin plots differ from box plots in that rather drawing lines on specific values, such as the median and the interquartile range, these violin plots actually give you a suggestion of the density of the data points, right? So wherever the violin plot is wider, that means we have a higher density of data points. And wherever it is narrower, that means we have fewer data points. So the violin plot is a very nice aesthetic way of visualizing the density of data points in all of your variables. And it looks like we have some positive skew in each of these, right? Most of our participants tend to be below about seven. Um, that's where the highest density of scores on all of the stimulus categories. And then that tails off as you get above seven and we have fewer and fewer correct observations. So I quite like uh, using the Geome Violin, right, for, for showing the density of these different plots here. And I'm going to export this uh, to the clipboard. And then I will paste it into Word uh, as the correct answer you know, for this question. And again, it doesn't seem like some of the stimulus categories were easier to learn than others. I would say yes here. Uh, we, we have at least some evidence that the first four categories seem to be easier to learn than the fifth. Okay, so for question number four, we can aggregate the data to get a median response time for correct and incorrect answers per stimulus category per person. And then we want to create a plot to show the distribution of response time as a function of stimulus category and accuracy of the current response. Then we want to know, do participants appear to be faster on correct trials than on incorrect trials? And does this difference appear to depend on the stimulus category? So again, we're going to need to aggregate our data in order to answer this question. But now rather than the total number correct, what we actually want to know is the median response time for each stimulus category. So one of the things that I'm going to do is have to filter out that one trial in which we didn't have a response for correct or incorrect, right? There was a, a, an error in the computer, or maybe the participant just didn't make a decision in time, right? But they had one NA um, for that correct variable column. So I'm going to take our original data, dat1, push it through a pipe into the filter function in order to remove any instances where correct equal does not equal, or sorry, in order to keep any instances where correct does not equal NA. So this will drop uh, any missing values or any rows with missing values um, from, from our data there. And then we'll push that into the select uh, function. I will select the columns that I want to work with. And then I'll push that into the group by function. So I'll group it by subject, stimulus category, and correct. Right. So what this means is then when I go to do my summarize, for each person in each stimulus category, it will separately calculate the median response time in the correct stimuli first, and then in the incorrect stimuli. So if I run that code, I'm going to end up with a new data frame where I have subject ID, stimulus category, then whether or not that was correct or incorrect, and then the median response time for each of those types of trials, right? So across trials for subject one, stimulus category one, when they were correct, their median response time was 31,000 milliseconds. When they were incorrect, their median response time was 41,000 milliseconds. So this person is taking a pretty long time to, to answer uh, in any case, but they do tend to be a little bit faster for correct than incorrect trials, at least on category one. So it looks like I've restructured my data in the correct way in order to get one observation per person, per stimulus, per response type. And now I can use the ggplot code, either on line 59 or on line 64, uh, in order to plot this, again, as a function of the data points and overlaying a box plot, uh, which I have here on, on line 59. Right, so I'm plotting this uh, with the individual data points, color-coded by whether they were correct or incorrect. Right, and then a box plot, which is also color-coded by whether a response was correct or incorrect. And because on my x-axis, I've specified that the x-axis is the stimulus category, that's going to allow ggplot to ultimately break this rather intelligently into two different clusters. So first it will cluster it based on the stimulus category, and then within that category, it'll tell me if this was a correct response or an incorrect response. And across participants, we can see that in general, people were slower to respond on their incorrect responses than on their correct responses. Although that pattern is attenuated a little bit for that rather problematic um, fifth stimulus category. Again, rather than using the box plot, a more sort of qualitative way of looking at this is to use the violin plot and use geome violin, but it gives me a very similar uh, pattern in the data. 
where now I'm looking at the density of the different data points as a function of stimulus category and response accuracy. Uh, and I can copy this plot and insert it into Word in order to answer this question. Okay, so question number five. Next, we want to aggregate the data across subjects to get the average accuracy over trials. So we want to average across people in order to get the average accuracy over time. And we want to generate a plot to show how the proportion of correct responses changes over time. To answer the question, does it seem like participants are learning the correct categories? So if we go into R here, Again, we're going to have to create a new data frame because now we're aggregating across people um, in order to answer this question. So we are going to take our data um, and we're going to create a new data frame called DAT4. Uh, so I'm going to, again, filter out any rows where uh, correct or incorrect responses were missing. Um, and then I'm going to select the variables subject ID, trial, and correct, right, whether or not the current response was correct. But now, rather than grouping by subject, I'm going to group by trial here because I want to average across people in order to get the proportion correct on each trial. And then what I'm going to do in the summarize function is take the create a new variable called p correct for proportion correct, which is the average of the value does the correct variable equal correct. So again, it will evaluate this logical statement. If the value for that variable um, is correct, it will return true and be a one. If the value for that variable is incorrect, it will return false and be a zero. So I'm essentially taking a whole bunch of ones and zeros on each trial and then averaging them together. If half of the participants got it right and half of the participants got it wrong, this should return 0.5 because it's half and half. Right? If 100% of participants got it right, then all of these would evaluate to true, and all of the numbers would be 1, so then it would return a 1. So I'm going to get a proportion of value, or I'll get the proportion correct between 0 and 1 on each trial. So if I do that, I can then plot this as a function of trial. So now I've got my proportion correct evaluated on each trial, and you can see that as the trials go up, um, the proportion correct also linearly increases, um, or roughly linearly increases, I should say, um, because we also have some data points way up here at the very beginning um, where participants tended to be doing much better on average on the first two trials than on any of the rest of the trials. That's actually kind of a weird artifact of the experiment, where in our random number generator, right, where we generated a land, random list of categories for the trials, um, trial one happened to be tr category one, and trial two happened to be category two. Uh, so just by virtue of guessing number one on the first trial and number two on the second trial, participants actually did way better uh, here than they tended to do in the rest of the experiment. Um, but then you can see that progressively over time, people did still tend to learn those stimulus categories. So I will um, copy this to clip the clipboard. And then again, I will paste this into Word in order to answer that question. And yes, it does seem like participants are learning the stimulus categories over time. Now, another way you could do this rather than averaging across people is if you went back to the original data frame and you just looked at DAT1, um, where we have individual trials rather than um, uh, cumulative scores for each person. Um, you could plot those individual trial results and then use stat smooth to kind of draw a line through that data. And that would look something like this. Okay, so again, notice that here we're using DAT1 rather than the newly created DAT4 that we used in the previous plot. And now rather than plotting one data point per person, we're plotting one data point per uh, trial. And, and with a little bit of mathematics, I've realigned the hit variable, right, which was originally positive ones and negative ones, to now make it positive ones and zeros. Um, but now incorrect responses are at zero, correct responses are at one, and essentially what we're plotting is the average then between all the data points up here for trial one and all the data points down here for trial one then all the data points up here for trial two, and all the data points down here for trial two. And then we're fitting a line between it. The issue, though, of course, is that this is a dichotomous outcome, right? You are either correct or incorrect. 
what we were looking at before was a more continuous outcome measure because we were looking at the proportion correct across trials. So when I look at my data this way, um, it gives me a slightly different type of information than when I look at my data uh, in this way. So here I have one observation per trial on average across all of the people. In this view, I have one observation per trial, right? And I'm plotting each of those on the, on the uh, Y axis. And then my best fit line is effectively averaging between those data points. Uh, and it's kind of like calculating a moving average all along this trial line. So either of those would arguably work, um, but I think calculating the proportion correct across people is probably um, easier for readers to understand because you can say, oh, okay, I understand what each of these data points is. It was the average performance on that particular trial. And I can see that average performance going up over time. All right, so finally, going back to our de-aggregated raw data, um, we want to create a ridgeline plot to show the distribution of response times uh, for correct responses um, as a function of stimulus category. So we're going to need to go to the R graph gallery probably to get some inspiration on how to do this. But if you follow those links, you can see that you can do this using the GG ridges package um, or various combinations that expand on that. So there's also this um, Viridis package and the HRBR themes package. And you can install those in order to get um, some, some additional graphing functions that make your plots more colorful or more useful. Um, but what we want to do first is filter out any of the incorrect trials. Because again, we're going to want to plot um, response time only for the correct responses. So in order to get the distribution of response time for correct responses, I'll create a new data set called DAT5, where I push DAT1 through my pipe filtering out incorrect responses. So if I then look at this, all of my responses are now correct. Next, having already installed the package, I can add it to my library um, and I can use the ggridges functions in order to make a ridgeline plot. So I can run the code here on line 97, um, which and it has very similar code to ggplot2, right? Because ggridges is an add-on to ggplot2. Um, but I'm going to take my uh, underlying aesthetics, right, the mappings for the plot, and then I will do uh, geome density ridges. So it's going to create a series of stacked density plots, which you can see here. And now I have the density for each stimulus category and their response times. So this looks very similar to what we had done at the beginning, but now we're looking at it only for the correct responses. So if I copy this and save it, copy it to the clipboard, and then paste this into Word. This will help us answer the question about the distribution of response times across categories, but only for the correct responses. Right? And, and then we have a, a question in here about why is it important to focus only on response times for correct responses? Well, if you think about what we're trying to look at when we make this plot, Right? And, and the type of task that we're dealing with with our participants. Um, they are waiting at that keyboard, thinking about what the correct category is, and then they have to make a response. So if I want response time to be very informative about, for instance, the efficiency of processing, it's only appropriate that I sort of normalize the outcome. Right? How long did it take participants to make a response is somewhat confusing because there are two different types of responses that a person could make. It could be correct or incorrect. If I restrict it to only correct responses, I can now ask, how long did it take a person to make the correct response? And that's really then much more a measure of efficiency because the faster I can get to the correct response, the more efficient I'm actually being. So by reducing our outcomes to only those correct responses, our response time measure actually becomes more meaningful because we're no longer mixing different outcomes in. We're sort of reducing it, homogenizing the outcomes so that we can get a more meaningful measure of response time uh, when we actually make these plots. So I hope that helps. I hope you were able to generate some good quality figures yourself working in your groups. Um, you'll notice that a lot of the things that I created in my plots here are still a little bit messy in terms of the aesthetics, right? I could probably name my variables a little bit better. I could increase the size of some of these fonts. And I would encourage you to play around with those features of your plot, learning how to improve your graphics in ggplot.
And again, the end goal of this assignment is that you can come up with data visualizations that you would be proud to kind of show to your advisor in a meeting and say like, hey, I'm doing the quality assurance on these data and here's this interesting pattern I've discovered. Or it seems like one of our stimulus categories was harder than others and we didn't think that was going to be an issue, right? So by doing these sorts of data visualizations and improving your skill with it, not only can you learn important information about your data, um, but it will also then come in handy when it comes time to make data visualizations for for publication, right? When you're really trying to show the results of your statistical analysis rather than just the quality assurance steps of your data analysis.